To me, engineering is about taking risks and experimentation. In, in my mind, the only rule when recording is whatever sounds best wins. And um, there's a, a few different types of microphones I use when I record. The first is, is a dynamic microphone that people know, uh, like the Shure 57 or 58, it's often used live. Uh, you can hold it in your hand, unlike some microphones. And what I mean by a dynamic microphone is exactly what you put in is exactly what comes out. There's no real change of it. If you scream this loud, it's going to be that loud coming out. Whereas a condenser microphone, like this guy over here, this is the Neumann U87, a very famous mic. People used it on John Coltrane's saxophone and, you know, Elvis sang into it, all kinds of people use this for all kinds of things. It's a condenser microphone, so it's a lot different than a dynamic microphone because um, it changes the sound. It kind of compresses um, the distance, like a telephoto lens, compresses the distance between foreground and background. A condenser mic kind of takes things from very far away or close and, you know, makes them more the same. Um, it's great on vocals, horns, um, over, over a drummer to get cymbals. Um, it's, it's, it's great for all kinds of things. And one of my favorite microphones is the ribbon microphone. This is a, a Coles 4038, and it was made uh, it was made famous. Uh, they used it a lot on the Beatles albums as a drum overhead on Ringo Starr. Um, it does something to cymbals that no other mic does. It, it is inherently darker. It doesn't pick up frequencies higher up in in the spectrum, and uh, it kind of makes your cymbals sound more like sugar less harsh and more more sweet and round. Um, the one thing about it is you can't uh, make any air on a ribbon microphone. It, uh, If you were to blow in it or sneeze on it, it would be ruined. So it's very delicate. I think that, that you have to have a ribbon to sound like a ribbon and you have to have a condenser to sound like a condenser. They make a lot of plugins that do magical things, but they, they don't have one that makes a a dynamic sound like a condenser or a condenser sound like a ribbon. That's something you, you have to have the, the actual mic to, to achieve that particular sound. Choosing the mic, yeah, is, is an important thing. This goes back to one of my rules, whatever sounds best wins. So people might teach you or might say in a book, you have to use a dynamic microphone. You can't use a condenser on a kick drum or really, you know, try it out and see what you think. Is, is my advice because some of the coolest sounds I've ever gotten were because I used something that you weren't supposed to on something that you should never do. Uh, and is the other is there another element of placement? Placement is is really important. Um, it's really easy to just put a mic somewhere and then adjust the treble and bass to make it the way you want. But before you even reach for for treble and bass and adjustments, you can do a lot of the same thing just by moving the microphone around. So uh, I, I do think that, that placement is really important. And you can spend a lot of time just moving a, a matter of inches or millimeters and can, can make a huge difference on, uh, on the tonality of, of, of a drum or, or uh, a guitar, speaker, or anything really. So there's choice of mic, there's placement, and uh, another important element is your, your choice of preamp, which is more of a luxury because people recording in their bedroom are going to have the, the microphone or the preamp that's built into their little Pro Tools or built into their little mixer. Uh, in a studio, you have often have many different kinds of preamps, and each preamp has its own coloration. Um, or lack of coloration. Sometimes you choose a microphone because it's completely transparent and doesn't color the sound at all. A lot of my favorite preamps are very colored and change the sound a lot, like a Neve or an API preamp as opposed to a Grace or a Millennia, which are very transparent, because um, that can, can change the sound a lot. And before you even have to reach for a bass adjustment, maybe this preamp is more bassy. So that's one of the ways to, to do it. Traditional Recording education says that you should record everything with no EQ and no compression, 
completely dry and then only take steps to do those things in the mix. That's very safe. I really like to EQ and compress beforehand because uh, that way when I'm done, I don't have to put any plug-ins or I don't have to really do anything to it. It's almost already there. You just pull the faders up and it sounds the way I want to rather than having to go in and really adjust it and fix this and compress that. I like to do it beforehand, but it's risky because you have to get it right because once you do it, it's done and there's no going back. That's why they teach you not to do it. But if you can get it right, it's, I find it's better to do it if you're recording digitally especially because if you go through an analog EQ and an analog compressor before it even hits the computer, your sound is the way you want it to be without having to go in and start using plugins to, to do digital processing.